welcome those watching our live stream online. My name is Adam Oakes, and I'm the chairman of Liberty University's Young Americans for Freedom chapter. We as LU YAF stand for religious freedom, limited government, and a strong national defense. Our chapter has accomplished a wide range of campus initiatives, such as the 9-11 Never Forget Project, Freedom Week, and the GPA Redistribution Contest, among others, and by hosting prominent conservative speakers. Tonight, we welcome Dinesh D'Souza. Mr. D'Souza has had 25 years as a career writer, scholar, and public intellect. A former policy analyst in the Reagan White House, D'Souza also served as John M. Allen Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and the Robert Karen Rishwain Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. He served as the president of King's College in New York City from 2010 to 2012. Called one of the top young public policymakers in the country by Investors Business Daily, D'Souza quickly became known as a major influencer on public policy through his writings. His first book, Illiberal Education, publicized the phenomenon of political correctness in America's colleges and universities and became a New York Times bestseller for 15 weeks. It has been listed as one of the most influential books of the 1990s. In 1995, D Dinesh published The End of Racism, which became one of the most controversial books of the time and another national bestseller. His 1997 book, Ronald Reagan, How an Ordinary Man Became an Extraordinary Leader, was the first book to make the case for Reagan's intellectual and political importance. The latest book by the best-selling author is Stealing America, what my experience with criminal gangs taught me about Obama, Hillary, and the Democratic Party. Mr. D'Souza has also directed two of the most popular conservative documentaries of our time, 2016, Obama's America, and America, Imagine the World Without Her. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Dinesh D'Souza. Thank you, um, thank you very much. Wow, it's, um, it's great to be here, this is fantastic. Uh, I'm honored to speak at Liberty. I came to Lynchburg for the first time, um, boy, this was in the mid-1980s. Um, I wrote a series of articles on uh, Jerry Falwell, and I remember uh, meeting Mrs. Falwell and the two young Falwell boys who were actually quite young then. Um, and it's wonderful to see this university prosper and see all the things it's done in the meantime. This is just wonderful to be a part of. Um, I'm an immigrant to the United States. I came to America at the age of 17. I was born in Bombay, India. And uh, I still remember uh, my first feeling when I saw America uh, really out of the airplane as I was landing at JFK Airport. Uh, on my way to Arizona to be uh, an exchange student, go to public school there. And I looked out of the window and I saw the skyline of New York and I saw the Statue of Liberty. And I kind of had this very odd feeling that my whole life was about to change uh, dramatically. And that if I stayed in America, I would actually have a, a very different kind of life than I would have had if I had never come. I didn't know then, but I was moving from the periphery of the world to the center. And I was also moving into a society uh, based upon principles that I didn't at the time understand, but somehow I knew what they actually meant. And what they meant was that for the first time I would be the architect of my own destiny. Uh, and that's something we tend to take for granted in America. It's a country where we can write the script of our own life. The core idea of America is not economic success or even opportunity, uh, but it's the idea of being in the driver's seat of your own destiny. That your major decisions of life uh, are made by you. Your life is like a blank sheet of paper. Uh, you are the artist. Now, this idea of America is very unique. Uh, it is being today exported to other parts of the world. 
Ironically, even while that's happening, to me, this very same American idea, the same American dream, has become very controversial in this country. It's actually, in my view, being subverted from within in the United States. At the same time, the world has changed dramatically since the 1980s. Uh, we sometimes think, uh, as we look to the election, we're waiting for Reagan. We're waiting for another Reagan. But the world of Reagan was completely different than the world that you face today. The world of Reagan was a world of stagflation, which is to say stagnant growth and runaway inflation. Uh, it was a world of the Cold War, a Soviet bear on the prowl. Ten countries had fallen into the Soviet orbit between 1974, uh, when Vietnam collapsed, and uh, 1980, um, which was shortly after the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. So that was the landscape of politics then. And actually, it was a, a quite familiar landscape, because communism, socialism, and by the way, even before that, fascism, Nazism, these are actually all Western ideas. And by Western ideas, I mean that they spring out of a familiar intellectual and political soil. There was a powerful movement in the early 20th century directed toward planning and organizing society, controlling it from the center. Uh, Reagan called this collectivism. But this same collectivist idea branched into the welfare state in America and Europe, uh, fascism in Germany and Italy. And what is fascism? Fascism is basically state control of industry, the state directing private industry. And then socialism, Marxism. Marx, remember, was a dead white male. So Marx comes out of the Western tradition. And so in the Cold War, the main question was, does America have the will to stand up for its principles? Since then, though, we have actually seen some remarkable changes in the world. They were foreshadowed earlier, but even those of us who were there at the time, it was very difficult to see their importance. The philosopher Hegel says that the owl of Minerva flies by night. And what he means by that, Minerva referring to wisdom, and the owl of Minerva flies by night simply means that it is only in retrospect that we can understand the events of history for what their significance truly is. This is also, by the way, true of our own life. You make a small decision, and it leads you to meeting the person that you'll end up marrying. Uh, you choose a line, and you leapfrog to something else, and you end up completely different from where you planned to start. Only looking back through the rear view wi window does the pattern of your life begin to take a certain kind of coherent shape. So right in the middle of the Cold War, there was a small thing going on, kind of a sideshow, and that was this bearded mullah, the Ayatollah Khomeini, was uh, raving and ranting about the United States. The United States is the great Satan. Uh, Muslims should uh, commit suicide uh, and become martyrs for Islam. And at the time, it basically seemed like a fairly typical third world sight of a discontented fellow jumping up and down. It's a fairly familiar sight in many parts of the world. And it was difficult to see then that actually what was going on was something quite significant. What was going on was that radical Islam for the first time had taken over a major state. Now, radical Islam has been around since at least the 1920s. You can probably date it to the formation of the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, some people say, well, radical Islam has been around since Islam. Radical Islam is Islam. Um, I don't think that's actually true. Uh, but we can talk about that. The actual organizations and institutions of radical Islam, Hamas, Hezbollah, the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, uh, these are all recent phenomena. You, don't, you didn't have Al-Qaeda in the 19th century, for example. The Muslim Brotherhood was, is the oldest and largest and strongest of all the organizations of radical Islam in the world. So this thing got going in the 1920s, but it was on the outside of society. The radical Muslims did not control any real estate. But for the first time with Khomeini, they did. Now, 
The reason this is actually quite significant is that the reason we got Khomeini uh, is basically because of one of the gigantic blunders of American foreign policy. And in order to understand what that blunder is, we, we need to articulate the core principle of American foreign policy. And it's not just American foreign policy, it's any foreign policy. It's the principle of the lesser evil. The principle of the lesser evil means that in the real world, as opposed to the philosophy seminar, you are, you're often not choosing between the good guy and the bad guy. You're choosing between the bad guy and the really bad guy. And the question becomes, what do you do then? And the principle of the lesser evil argues that it is sometimes, not always, legitimate to ally with the bad guy to get rid of the worst guy. You choose the lesser evil to, pre to prevent the greater evil. Now, a classic example of this would be in World War II. The United States allies with a bad guy, Stalin, because another bad guy, Hitler, poses a greater threat at the time. Was this justified? Yes. Now, those choices always have consequences, because remember that, that the choice of the lesser evil is still an evil. A lesser evil is not a good. A lesser evil it may be the prudent choice under the circumstances, but it is still an evil. And so if you ally with Stalin against Hitler, what happens is Stalin's armies begin to converge on Berlin and end up occupying half of Europe. And they stay there after the war. The United States decides to support the Afghan Mujahideen to push the Soviet Union out. Principle of the lesser evil. We're trying to defeat Soviet communism. There's a bunch of ragtag Muslims fighting in Afghanistan. They come from all over the Muslim world. Should we help them? Of course we should. Reagan was actually very smart about it. The Reagan doctrine, by the way, very different than the Bush doctrine. The Bush doctrine is commit troops. To quote Colin Powell, if you break it, you've got to fix it. You go into a country, you have to now rebuild the country. It's kind of like if you went into a store and broke something, you have to actually pay for it. And so the United States paid for the Iraq war. By the way, this is historically unprecedented. Any other empire that did the Iraq war would make the Iraqis pay for it with their oil. It is a mark of the munificence of America that we, a country in debt, take the burden of that war and then turn the keys of the oil fields to the Iraqis and say basically it's your oil. Use it, sell it, burn it. It's yours. But coming back to Khomeini for a second, if before Khomeini, uh, Iran was ruled by the Shah. The Shah of Iran was a, was a bad guy. He had a secret police. And so when Jimmy Carter was elected in 1976, Jimmy Carter said, I'm a very virtuous man, and I cannot be allied with this bad guy, the Shah of Iran. I have to pull the Persian rug out from under him. And so the United States did. We essentially withdraw our support from, for the Shah. The Shah begins to totter. The mullahs come into the street. The Shah falls. And what do we get? Khomeini. So in other words, in trying to get rid of the bad guy, we get the worst guy. That's called ignoring the principle of the lesser evil. And that actually is the root of many of our current problems, because for the first time, radical Islam gets a geographic foothold on a major Muslim country. In the Middle East, by the way, there are only three major Muslim countries. There is Saudi Arabia, there's Egypt, and there's Iran, the three most important countries in the region. And Iran is now on the other side. Um, Egypt is, let's say, fragile, um, and Saudi Arabia is also precarious. By the way, none of these are the, the largest Muslim um, democracy in the world is Indonesia. Uh, the second largest is Pakistan. So there are big countries, Islamic countries, outside the Middle East. So you should keep in mind that the Muslim world is very large, 22 countries, uh, and this is partly why we have to be a little careful in when we, when we talk about Islam. There are different species of Islam, just like there are actually different species of Christianity. Christianity probably looks quite different in Brazil 
than it looks, for example, in South Korea. And so let's remember we're dealing with this broad phenomenon. But the radical Islam comes into its own, and we didn't actually see it coming right back in the 1980s. And now let's fast forward uh, a little bit to the present, talk a little bit about our peculiar situation now. In the film 2016, I made some predictions about Obama. Uh, one of them was that some of them had to do with his domestic policy, that he would promiscuously spend money. He's actually got the remarkable distinction. This is a strange thing to go on in history, but he has single-handedly doubled the national debt. The national debt was eight and a half trillion when, he, when Obama came in. It's now well over $17 trillion. So that is a, I don't know if you'd call it an achievement, but um, that's something that's very notable. The second thing I said about Obama is that he would undermine our allies and strengthen our enemies. Now this was a very controversial prediction because if you think about it, there is no way to undermine our allies and strengthen our enemies unless you want to do it. In other words, there has been now in America for eight years a prevailing Republican and conservative idea. You pretty much hear it from a number of the Republican candidates running for president. Obama doesn't get it. Obama's a bungler. That guy can't even read off the teleprompter, et cetera, et cetera. And what I was saying is something very different. Obama's not a bungler. In fact, if he was a bungler, when people are bunglers, their mistakes fall on both sides of the aisle. They have, there's a certain random quality to bunglers. Uh, uh, they don't know what they're doing. And so they're just as likely to trip to the left as they are to trip to the right. Obama always trips in the same direction. <laughs> and what this really means is that Obama has a goal. Now, it's, his goal is not that he's a secret Muslim. It's not that he is in bed with the terrorists. Anyone who sees Obama and kind of gets Obama realizes that, oh, that there doesn't really seem to be too much of a religious bone in that guy's body. Can you, can you imagine that guy praying five times a day? Uh, so please don't send the fellow any prayer rugs. Uh, uh, he's, not, he's not a covert Muslim. What it is is he has an ideology that dovetails with radical Islam. And this is where I want to go in this talk. Um, Obama has a view of America that um, involves subtracting and contracting and withdrawing American influence in the Middle East. That creates a vacuum in which groups like Al-Qaeda, but now especially ISIS, can, can flourish. Now, let's, let's sort of test this theory about Obama willfully strengthening our enemies and weakening our allies. You can always test a theory by looking to see what actually has happened in the Middle East. And if we trace over the Obama years, who are the leaders of the Middle East who were there, but are now either dead or kicked out? And then who are the leaders in the Middle East who were there, who are still there, and are actually stronger? So let's look at them. Qaddafi. Qaddafi was not an ally, but he was doing business with America. He was actually giving us information on terrorism. He was outing people who were selling nuclear secrets, like the Pakistani uh, AQ Khan. Gaddafi was working with us. He became very scared after the Iraq war. And we got rid of him and killed him. Hillary Clinton said, laughingly, we came, we saw, he died, a reference to a phrase by Julius Caesar. So we got rid of him, Gaddafi. Mubarak, the leader of Egypt, ally of the United States, uh, enemy of the Muslim Brotherhood. During the Arab Spring, the United States withdrew support or pulled back its support for Egypt. Down goes Mubarak, he's out. In fact, the Muslim Brotherhood came in. Now, what's really interesting is to compare Obama in that situation versus Jimmy Carter uh, a generation earlier. When Carter got rid of the Shah and got Khomeini, Carter was openly dismayed. He was like, oops. He had no idea. He was completely shocked. But when Obama 
helped to push Mubarak out and the Muslim Brotherhood came in, Obama seemed to be serene. He seemed kind of excited. It's almost like this was part of what he was very happy to have. So here are two American, if not allies, at least people cooperating with us, and they're gone. Meanwhile, Assad is still in Syria. The mullahs are still in Iran. So in other words, our, our deadly enemies remain in power. In fact, we're making deals with them. And meanwhile, Obama is turning the cold shoulder to Israel. So if someone had said eight years ago the United States would be aligned with Iran and antagonistic to Israel's self-perceived interest on an issue of existential security, even most Democrats, I think, would have thought that is extremely unlikely. But that is actually the world in which we live now. So here's what I'm getting at with regard to American foreign policy. It looks to me like what is happening under this administration is a, a deliberate effort to reduce American power. Why? Because Obama has this view that the world is wrong side up. The ship of the world is turned wrong side up. That some cultures have too much. Too much economic power, too high a standard of living, they use too much health care, they use too much oil. And what gives them the right to do that? The United States has 5% of the world's population. What gives us the right to use 20% of the world's oil? Why do we have a standard of living that is many times our actual proportion of people in the world? Well, my answer is that's because the United States creates more wealth than other countries. And people, by and large, get to create the wealth that they, to keep the wealth that they create. And that's why the United States lives as it does. But for Obama, this is an index of global injustice. Let's talk for a minute about Islam. Because to my way of thinking, people often talk about you know, whether the Muslim world is divided between the fundamentalists and the liberals. But this is an absurd and meaningless distinction. First of all, as you know, fundamentalist is a term out of Protestant Christianity. There are no fundamentalists in the Muslim world. And quite frankly, there are no liberals. There is no meaningful liberal movement in any Islamic country that would be liberal in the sense that we understand the term today. You couldn't get, for example, you know, Muslims for Dukakis. <laughs> or, so, I mean, there are some liberals. There are some Muslims who are liberals, but they live in LA. <laughs> so, in no Muslim country is this a meaningful phenomenon. So the, so the Muslim world, to my way of thinking, is actually divided differently. It's divided between what I'm going to call the traditional Muslims and the radical Muslims. Now, this is actually a very interesting phenomenon because the traditional Muslims are actually not very far from traditional Jews or traditional Christians. Remember that Islam came out of the same soil as Judaism and Christianity. And Islam actually has more in common with Judaism than it does with Christianity. Why? Because Christianity is actually a, a creedal religion. Christianity is based on belief. I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. The acceptance, the will, is, is critical. Islam is a religion of law. So the Muslims don't really care whether the woman is modest. They just wanted to wear the veil. What she's actually thinking in her head is of no consequence whatsoever. It is a matter of outward conformity to actual law. In that sense, Islam resembles the Old Testament. The Old Testament was a, was, is a book of rules and codes and commandments. And your job is to follow them. So traditional Islam is this way. And Sharia law is a product not of radical Islam. Sharia law is a product of traditional Islam. And so all the ingredients of Sharia, even the ones we find somewhat shocking, you will generally find in ancient Judaism. They're very, very similar. And so, for example, if you take something like the, the veil, 
by the way, in different Muslim countries based on culture, the veil is different. So in some countries like Afghanistan, you see the full burqa. This is why Afghan women can't enter the Miss Universe contest. <laughs> in any event, but other Muslim countries that might be quite radical, like Iran, women don't wear burqas. They just wear the headscarf. That's because Iranian culture is different. It's actually not an Arab culture. And it's always been less restrictive socially uh, than, for example, Saudi Arabia or Afghanistan, for that matter. So you have traditional Islam and you have radical Islam. So what's the difference between these two, these two types of Islam? The real difference is this, that radical Islam is a political movement that is a response to the greatly diminished power of Islam in the world today. Historically, Islam, I mean, let's look at the world. If you were to pull back, get the bird's eye view of history, historically, the two most important cultures in the world have been the culture of China and the culture of the Islamic world. Number one and number two. If you had to allocate number three, it probably would go to India, and number four would be the culture of Europe. This would be the state of the world circa about 1500 AD. And we're measuring strength here in terms of wealth, influence, uh, intellectual achievement, all the normal indices of power and influence. But then in a remarkable development, what happens is, is that Western culture begins to get stronger, and Islamic culture begins to go down. To such a point that today, if you were to subtract the influence of oil, of oil, the Muslim world would join sub-Saharan Africa as being the most unimportant, inconsequential part of the planet. In other words, the whole thing could go into the ocean and ba basically the Dow Jones average would be unaffected. If you subtract the influence of oil. Now, this is a very scary thought because because we live in a technological era in which it is not inconceivable that there will be new sources of energy that will make oil go, go down, become less important. The Muslims know this, and so they have been trying to diagnose what has happened to them. Why has their culture, once so strong, become so weak? And the radical Muslims have basically come up with an answer, and that is that the reason this has happened is that we have stopped being, you might say, real Muslims. So they diagnose their plight as one of needing to renew Islam and return to the kind of militaristic, politicized Islam that was there at the beginning. Remember, Islam was a terrifying sight to behold in the se from the 7th century till about the 10th century. Today, again, looking through the backward rearview mirror, people say, oh, the Crusades were horrible. Why do we do the Crusades? It was our fault. Oh, really? Well, uh, that whole region that we call the Middle East, used to be Christian. Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, all Christian. So the Muslims conquer it all. And then Muslim armies go south into Africa, east into Asia, north into Europe. They conquer parts of Italy, all of Spain, which they rule for 700 years. They're at the gates of Vienna. And finally, belatedly, the sleepy Christians wake up and say, what the heck? <laughs> and begin to mobilize some French knights and storm Jerusalem, briefly retake. So the Crusades are a belated, clumsy, ineffective effort to defend against Islamic irredentism and conquest. And so, you know, um, Gibbon, the historian who wrote The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, no friend of Christianity, but Gibbon says that had the Crusades not happened, had the Christians not mounted a counterattack, he goes, in our time, writing in the 18th century, he goes, the teachings of Muhammad would be the curriculum in Oxford and Cambridge. In other words, the Muslims would have taken all of Europe. There was nothing to stop them if they had not been, in fact, stopped. All right, so the radical Muslims are trying to restore under new circumstances, circumstances not of strength but weakness, that initial fire of Islam that made Islamic armies unstoppable and made Islam uh, a spectacular force in the world. There were five Islamic empires operating simultaneously. 
uh, the Mughal Empire in India, for example, the Safavid dynasty, uh, and then the biggest was the Ottoman Empire, based in Turkey. All of this is going on um, not, not that far back in history. Today, in the movie 2016, coming back to projections about Obama and projections about the world, I said, what looks to be happening in the Muslim world is for the first time the rise of, and the term I used was the United States of Islam. The United States of Islam. And what that means is, that's not Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is basically a website and terrorists on the monkey bars. Al-Qaeda doesn't have any territory. That's why they had to go to Afghanistan, courtesy of invitations from the Taliban. So that's, that's ragtag terrorism. It can have a tremendous impact, but it's totally different than controlling territory, having armies, having a parliament. So the Iranians have a parliament. They meet in Tehran. They control the capital. They're building nuclear bombs. So in addition to Iran, in the movie 2016, I predicted that there would be a transnational force emerging across the Islamic world. The United States of Islam, I called it. It, it essentially was an, an effort to create a transnational Islamic state. And that state currently has a name, and its name is ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. For some bizarre reason, Obama keeps calling it ISIL. I don't know what ISIL is. I think it's the metrosexual term for ISIS. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being slightly facetious. But, <laughs> but so this is what's happening in the Muslim world. Now, normally, this is, not a, this is not an existential threat to the United States if, if, if the United States were united. The United States united could quite easily deal with the threat of radical Islam. Radical Islam is a very annoying uh, fly, but the United States has a pretty large fly swatter. But our problem isn't that we don't have the resources to fight radical Islam, or we don't know how to. It rather is that we are bitterly divided over who we are, and what we stand for, and what our role is in the world. Jefferson called the United States an empire of liberty. And what he meant by that is that we export liberty. That's our product were a very strange kind of empire because we don't actually want to rule other countries, but we do want them to use our recipe. Our foreign policy at the end of the day is very modest. Don't bomb us and trade with us. And that's pretty much it. The Reagan doctrine, which I mentioned earlier, to me is much preferable to the Bush doctrine. The Reagan doctrine is very simple. We do not fight for other people's liberty. They fight. We help. And so going back to when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, the United States didn't go, it's our fight. Let's, they send in 100,000 troops. We should send in 100,000 troops. We sent in no troops. We sent in some CIA advisors. And when the Soviets had helicopters shooting at the Muslims from the sky, we gave the Muslims some handheld rockets to shoot those helicopters down. They fight. We help. This, to me, is the root of a renewed Republican foreign policy. It's, it's stepping out, avoiding the kind of the twin extremes of isolationism on the one hand and the kind of promiscuous interventionism on the other. We don't need either one. The United States can be a friend to liberty using prudent ways to help freedom where it exists in a manner that suits us. We can't do it always. Now, what I think is scary about the progressives in this country, and Hillary is a very good example of this, is that their main preoccupation is with the project that I'm loosely going to call Stealing America. Stealing America. What I mean by Stealing America is something like this. Um, Hillary Clinton has a proposal to give all of you 
a free college education. Really good idea, and I see a couple of smiles in the room. Free college education. Sounds really good. Now, in fact, education isn't free. Here we are in, at Liberty. There are expensive buildings all over the place. Someone tells me you have some kind of an inner tubing skiway facility. <laughs> I don't know if you serve cappuccinos in the back of the classrooms. But nevertheless, it costs money for you to go here. So no, it's not actually free. You have to pay the professors, you have to pay for the microphones, and you've got books. And so it's not actually free. So when Hillary says it's going to be free, what she actually means isn't that. What she actually means is it's going to cost money, but you're not going to pay. Who's going to pay? Well, the government's going to pay. How? Being $19 trillion in debt, we're going to have to borrow the money. And so we do. And this debt, wrapped up in a nice big package, is going to be handed off to somebody. Who's that? You. Your generation is going to be handed the debt. In other words, what Hillary is proposing is to reach into your own back pocket, take money from your own future earnings, and give it to you now, and pretend that she is giving you a free education. She's actually not doing you any favors at all. She's not robbing Peter to pay Paul, she's robbing Paul to pay Paul, which is to say you. But what she gets out of it is your lifelong political allegiance. Hillary did this. It's kind of funny, not too far from here in West Virginia, if you drive around, you see all these things named after Robert Byrd, the Robert Byrd Freeway, the Robert Byrd Medical Center, the Robert Byrd this, the Robert Byrd that. Now, when I was at Dartmouth, I saw buildings named after philanthropists who donated the money to, to give those buildings. But Robert Byrd didn't donate any money for any of this stuff. Why then does it bear his name? Because he was the guy who reached into the back pocket of somebody, lifted their wallet, and allocated the money to that purpose. In other words, he is the thief who actually did the pickpocketing of some productive, hardworking guy to pay for something that then the crook gets to put his name on. And this is basically modern progressivism in a nutshell. It's generosity with other people's money. Now the Clintons have taken this to a completely different level because we've had Tammany Hall type of corruption in America now for over a hundred years. You saw it in New York, it's with a daily machine in Chicago, but never before have we had a Secretary of State who's essentially put American foreign policy up for <coughs> rent. In other words, look at all this stuff swirling around Hillary. No one seems to be asking why. We're focusing uh, just on what she did and didn't do. She maintained a whole private email system. Now, if you know anything about security, you know that that's not easy to do. This is not a matter of like having one email that you access on your iPhone and another one on your iPad. Because actual classified information is a whole different system. You have to go into a whole different room. You've got to be searched. You've got, you need special passwords. You or I can't send an email into that system. It's a different system. If you want to take information out of there, you've got to put it on a thumb drive, hide the thumb drive, and smuggle it out. And you have to get your aides to conspire with you if they're going to do it for you. So it takes a lot of trouble to do it. Why do it? Unless you're doing stuff with foreign policy that you don't want anybody else to know. Unless you're doing stuff with foreign policy that you cannot afford to have on the official system. The point I'm trying to make is while dangerous things are going on in the world, Benghazi, a really good example. Think about it. People keep saying, Hillary got the call, Hillary got the call, Hillary didn't do anything. Why didn't Hillary do anything? You think Hillary is incapable of, 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 of understanding the import of a phone call or making a decision? This is a woman who's been in public life her whole life. No one denies her ability to process information. No one denies her functional capabilities. The point I'm trying to make is that what's going on with progressivism is it's so focused on looting America. Now by looting America, I want to be really clear. We're not talking about looting the government. That's small fry. That's $3 trillion. It's a very big number. But that's only the federal government. Our economy is $19 trillion. That's a bigger number. 
That's the GDP. But I'm talking about the real wealth of America, the whole thing. If you think about, think about this question, what is the most valuable thing that the world has ever made? The most valuable, is it the automobile? Is it the telegraph? The computer? No. The most valuable thing the world has ever made is the United States of America. A huge agglomeration of wealth, if you add it all up, 90 trillion dollars. Every piece of real estate, every stock account, all the money in your bank accounts and your parents' bank accounts, your college fund, retirement funds, all the value of all the buildings and all the cars and all the computers, and you add it all up, that's the wealth of America, 90 trillion dollars. And that is what the progressives want to control. They don't actually want to create the wealth. They're not socialists. Socialists actually want to control the means of production. Progressives are too lazy to be socialists. <laughs> they don't want to go dig oil out of the ground. It's a heck of a lot of work. They don't know how to. You think Obama knows how to go frack for oil? That guy can't put up a website. <laughs> so in terms of actually doing things or creating wealth, the progressives are, the progressives are complete zeros. But they want to get their hands on that wealth. They want the government to regulate it. Now, they don't want the government to regulate it. They want to regulate it. So they're arrogating wealth and power to themselves. And so foreign policy is like a sideshow. It's like an annoyance. It's like we wish that ISIS would kind of shut up and just stay over there for right now, because every time they create an uproar, it distracts the progressives from what they're up to. They're looting Fort Knox. Now, the reason this is significant is that we as conservatives are always giving them lectures. It's kind of like a bunch of thieves are robbing a bank. And we go running up to them and say, thieves, stop. Don't rob the bank. It's a very bad idea. Because if you rob banks, people will be discouraged from putting money in banks. Who's going to put money in banks if the banks are going to be robbed? It's going to make interest rates go up. There are many undesirable macroeconomic effects. The thieves don't care. Their goal is to loot the bank. And so this is why what I'm going to call the Obama education project of the Republican Party has proven to be such a complete failure. For eight years, we're always lecturing Obama. Hey, Obama, we need to inform you that Vladimir Putin used to be a KGB agent. Hey, Obama, if the mullahs say they want a bomb, they probably do. Uh, hey, Obama, if you have confiscatory tax rates, it's going to cause the economy to falter and jobs to be scarce. We're always lecturing him about how the world is. And you notice he's a super slow learner. <laughs> he never seems to get it. And it's not because he's dumb. It's because he's not interested. He's about something completely different. So to sum up, before I open the door to questions, um, radical Islam is, in fact, a real threat. In fact, if I were to apply the Hegelian looking through the back rear wind window of history, it looks to me like the world is going in one of three directions. Right? It's not going in the Confucian direction. It's either going to go in the Christian direction, or it's going to go in the direction of radical secularism, or it's going to go in the direction of Islam. Those are the three options on the table. And what I mean by that is that those are the three options that actually have the power to convert, to win over people to its side. How it w they win over is not my concern right now, but to multiply their numbers. The Christians actually do the most converting. Christians multiply their numbers by conversion. Muslims multiply their numbers through reproduction. They have a lot of kids. Uh, so, but nevertheless, these are the growing movements of the world. And so when we look back 50 years from now, we'll see, looking back, wow, that was really important. These guys were really growing, and look at them now. Look at them now. So which one is it going to be? Ironically, this, the answer to that question is not up to Islam. The, the answer to that question is up to us. 
we will decide which of these three currents of history is going to be dominant. And therefore, to me, the real power of a university, the real power of young people, is that you combine three powerful things together. Knowledge, idealism, and action. All are really important. Knowledge is important because you need to understand the phenomenon. If Obama has a goal and he's taking us in this direction, it's pointless to lecture him. He needs to be stopped. So combining idealism, knowledge. Idealism is the natural gift of young people, and it's a very good thing. Never listen to conservatives who say, well, you're a liberal because that's because you're 19. But once you're 40 and paying a lot of taxes and are overweight and become really cynical about life, you'll become one of us. <laughs> no. That is not the kind of conservatism that we are marketing here. We are marketing the conservatism that is idealistic, but marries idealism to prudence and to, and to action. A long time ago, a professor of mine told me about the lion tamer and the lion. So here is the lion. Here is the lion tamer. And the lion tamer is this little guy with a stick. And he twirls the stick, and the lion keeps doing tricks based on the lion tamer. And the professor asks an interesting question. Who is more powerful, the lion tamer or the lion? And the answer is the lion. But now we have a mystery. If the lion is more powerful, why is the lion so obediently and sycophantically responding to the machinations of the lion tamer? And the answer is that the lion does not know its own power. The lion thinks the lion tamer is more powerful, but it's not true. So similarly, we think that those guys, Obama, Hillary, they have the power. They're doing it to us, but in our society, that's not so. The power is actually with us. Most of us use very little of our own actual power. But if we learn how to creatively harness it, then we can become what I want you to become, very dangerous Christians and very dangerous Americans. That should be your career goal. So no matter what you do, you want to be that kind of a Christian and that kind of an American because America needs you to be that way in order to restore, strengthen, protect our society. Thank you very much. Clipped on to me. Uh, do you have? Oh, here's a handheld. There we go. I uh, just came from the gym, so that's why <laughs> that's why I'm a little bit late. But I was. I uh, just want to let you know we're honored to have you at Liberty. He and I met 30 years ago when my father spoke at Dartmouth. You were a member of the Dartmouth Review, is that right? Yes. And it was a group like this that invited him up to speak, and it was such a contrast between the way your classmates treated him as a conservative and the way our students treated Bernie Sanders as a liberal. So that's one of the things I'm so proud of our students for. But I was on uh, Laura Ingram's show the other day, and she was talking about you. She remembered, what, was she in part of the same club? Or was she yeah, I was uh, class of 83 at Dartmouth, and she was 85. Okay. And in fact, I think we may have come down here with a, a bunch of us to, to interview your dad. That was later, but, uh, yes. but he spoke up there, I think, before that. Yeah. yeah. But, um, but anyway, Dinesh, been a, it's been a, a warrior for conservatism for as long as I've known him, and he's. And, and if you're going to be a warrior for conservatism, it's just a matter. It's not if you're going to be attacked or come under attack. It's when, and it's uh, it's something that all of you need to be prepared for. It's a different standard for conservatives. And the liberals seem to be able to get away with anything, and so it's. I don't know if this is all young Americans for freedom or is it just. We should have gotten you a bigger room. I can see that. <laughs> next, next time we'll get you a bigger room. But anyway, I just wanted to welcome you to Liberty and thank you for, for being here tonight. And, and what I heard, I'm, I'm with you 100%. All right. Awesome. Thank you. See you next. Thank you.
right, so right now we're going to transition into Q&A. Um, I guess since it's a little crowded, one of my talents is I can maneuver in large crowds, so I'm going to use that tonight. Um, so, or we can just come over here since we have the camera. Okay, so if you have a question, feel free to line up right here by me. Make sure that you just ask the question. Um, don't go on long tangents. And yeah, anything you have on your mind that you possibly would like to ask Mr. D'Souza, feel free to come on up. And then um, when I have the microphone over to you, please state your name as well. If you want to stand formal line right here behind me. All right. Hi, I'm Patrick Hillman. Thank you. Great uh, presentation. Can you elaborate on two points? Uh, one is how much of regime change in the Middle East is just completely outside of American control? The second question is, if the answer to radical Islam is an ideology, what is that ideology that would unite Americans against this threat? So the question is, uh, <coughs> what, would be a, what would be a way to combat, to combat radical Islam? Now, generally in America, there are two groups of people that want to even fight radical Islam. There's a whole group of people that doesn't want to fight radical Islam at all. Uh, and th the group of people that doesn't want to fight radical Islam by and large are united under the banner of multiculturalism. And that group of people doesn't want to fight radical Islam because its view is that radical Islam is essentially a, an oppressed minority. Radical Islam is kind of like American Indians or African Americans. It's one other minority group particularly in America. And so what, it ha what you need to do is you essentially need to accommodate it within American liberalism. And so multiculturalism tries to make space for radical Islam within its portals. The people who want to fight radical Islam fall into two camps. One are, I would say, the religious Christians, and the other are the secular atheists. The religious Christians want to fight radical Islam as a threat to Christianity. And the secular atheists want to fight radical Islam as part of their campaign against all religion. The, 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 the atheists believe that all religions are dangerous. And at one time, they, would, they kind of had the view that all religions are equally dangerous. Uh, I've debated a number of leading atheists uh, from Richard Dawkins to Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris. Most of those guys are very hostile, not just to radical Islam, but to traditional Islam. And part of the effect of our debates, I wish that part of the effect of our debates would be to bring them on their knees uh, to Christianity. But I think that the measurable effect of these debates has been to, to help those guys to see that radical Islam is in a different category than other religions. Because they keep saying things like religion is responsible for the violence of history. And then I would say to them things like, well, where are the Buddhist suicide bombers? And so uh, when they, c so it's not that all Muslims are terrorists, of course, but it is that the vast majority of terrorists today, in the, in the context that we're concerned with, do happen to be Muslims. And they do it in the name of Islam. That's their self-description of why they act. So um, the bottom line of it is, so we are two polar opposites. We've got the religious Christians and we've got the secular atheists, or the secular campaign against radical Islam. And it's not that easy to combine these two forces together. The, generally, the common ground of those two groups is, was religious freedom and the American way of life. And so you, you, you defend against radical Islam as a threat to the way of life of the United States, to our way of life. And that, to me, is probably the best way to do it, if it can be done. Michael Korn, could you please comment on the role of Turkey and which role it will play as a NATO member to the U.S.? It seems to fight against the, I uh, the ISIS, but also strengthen its own national um, ambitions. So the question is about Turkey. And uh, Turkey is a very good example of the um, 
two competing um, trends that we have seen in the Muslim world. So just about, I mentioned earlier Iran. The Shah of Iran was, was basically a secular guy. And he wanted to secularize, modernize, bring Iran into the modern world, integrate Iran, you might say, into the West. So that people in Iran would wear Western clothes. Iran looked like any other major Western city. And against him were the religious Muslims, the, represented by the Mullahs. Turkey was, for almost a generation, shaped by the influence of Ataturk, a military man, a secular guy. Uh, in fact, he went further than the Shah of Iran, uh, outlawing the veil, uh, outlawing the insignia of Islam, uh, and just declaring that Turkey is A, modern, B, not Islamic, secular, and C, part of Europe, not part of the Muslim world. Uh, I mean, a stunning um, declaration which, because of the enormous prestige of Ataturk, is kind of the Turkish Gandhi, if you will, it carried for about a quarter of a century. Um, but now there has been a kind of religious undertow, a kind of counter movement, and the current Islamic government not represents not radical Islam, but does represent traditional Islam, essentially declaring that the Ataturk era is over, that Turkey is a Muslim country. It may want to be in NATO, it may want to be in the EU, but its identity is also part of the Muslim world. These, this is one of the 22 houses of Islam, if you will. And so the United States can't count on it as a Western ally, as one of us, in the way that we have done uh, as, and did throughout the Cold War. So Turkey is, I would say, in flux. Hey, uh, my name is Alex Glenn. Uh, you mentioned in your speech that there were three pillars that, um, need, that are needed to, uh, to combat this. And you said it was knowledge, idealism, and action. Uh, which one of those do you think we as students could uh, work upon uh, to um, strengthen ourselves against this kind of threat? The question is, uh, do we need knowledge? Or do we need idealism? Do we need action? What I actually mean is we need the harnessing of all three to create some new things. Um, very often, uh, as young conservatives, you say, I'm going to graduate. Uh, should I go to the Heritage Foundation or work on the Hill? Or should I try to become like Sean Hannity? Um, what established path should I take? And my answer is that you can do those things, but if you really want to be a pioneer, that's actually the wrong question to ask. Not where do I want to go, but something different. What actually needs to be done? So here we are in politics, and we're fighting in one tiny corner of the battlefield, politics. Everywhere I go, hey, Dinesh, of the 10 guys on the podium, which Republican candidate do you think you support for president? This is like the endless, ceaseless, interminable question. Two years ago, hey, Dinesh, you think the Republicans are going to take the Congress? You think they want to get the Senate? The Republicans have the Congress, and it hasn't made that big of a whole lot of difference. Why not? Why not? Well, because McConnell is a wimp and Boehner is a rhino. <laughs> um, now, you know, think about this. Boehner doesn't want Obama to succeed. McConnell doesn't want the other side to win. Why are they wimps? Why are they rhinos? Why? The reason is that they are terrified of the media. McConnell knows, Boehner knows, that if he does what we want him to do, he would be destroyed in every talk show, on the CBS Morning News, on the Today Show, every comedian from Bill Maher to Colbert will be ridiculing him. There'll be exposés of him. He'll be, probably have his taxes audited. He will be so ruined <laughs> that you won't want to invite him to speak at Liberty. We will bury him. He knows that. And so he has a rational fear of the other side. The point I'm trying to make is while we are fighting in one corner of the battlefield, the left, has taken over the following megaphones of our culture. 
Hollywood, Broadway, the whole world of comedy. I mentioned Bill Maher, Colbert, John Stewart. Against them, we have nobody, nobody, and nobody. A very bad way to fight. Then they have higher education. They dominate the prestigious universities. They're moving into elementary and secondary schools. So they control the big megaphones of our culture. We cannot win long term if that is the case. We wonder how we're, we lost the gay marriage debate. The gay marriage debate began 25 years ago. We weren't even fighting. The gay marriage debate began when Ellen came out of the closet and Will and Grace and 400 sitcoms. And so if you want to fight, you want to be smart, you want to mobilize your idealism, you figure out a way to get a beachhead in Hollywood. You figure out a way to create new systems of educational delivery, new, pl new channels and platforms of media. Um, don't just try to be a pundit. We have a lot of pundits. We have a lot of talk radio. We have Fox News Channel, which is talk radio on TV. <laughs> we need, we don't actually have a conservative channel. And by that, a conservative channel would be, would have variety shows, movies, reality shows, comedy. Where's that? It doesn't exist. Create it. So what I'm trying to get at is this is what I mean by taking the baton. Uh, it's not becoming another foot soldier in somebody else's movement. It's, bec it's, it's becoming a supply cider. What needs to be done? How do I create that? Then go do it. Um, hello, my name is Daniel Clements, and I was a little confused as to the difference between uh, traditional and radical Islam. Um, would you classify Muhammad and much, much later the Tripoli Pirates as one or the other? So the question is, uh, was Muhammad a, a traditional Muslim or a radical Muslim? And the weird, this is a little bit of a weird thing to say, but Muhammad was actually not a Muslim, uh, in the same way that Christ was not a Christian. Um, we're Christians. We follow Christ, right? But Christ wasn't a Christian. Christ was, was, was the founder, the main guy, right? So in some ways, Christ operates on a different standard than the movement he creates, which is then sets up a set of institutions and practices that, that are aimed at, in a sense, realizing a certain ideal. Um, now, here's the thing. Muhammad kicked off Islam. He was a warrior. He was a desert guy. Uh, he was a Bedouin. Uh, he mobilized a ferocious army of Bedouin fighters. Uh, he himself went through different phases, the, the phase in Medina, the phase in Mecca. The, the Mecca phase was the warrior phase. Um, and Muslims today will look at Muhammad and they will claim this and they will claim that and they, they will pick on this saying and that saying. And look, the Quran is, is that kind of a book, right? It's an accordion. Uh, and you can find in it jihad interpreted as argument and persuasion and spiritual uh, discipline. And then you can interpret jihad as a whole bunch of Muslims on horseback with long swords riding like hell into the desert. Both ideas of jihad are in the Quran. So what I'm getting at is in the big house of Islam, 22 countries, Muslims interpret this book. And it's more important to look at what they do than just read what the book says. Just like you could take the Old Testament. If your children are disobedient, stone them. Now, you can even go to Orthodox Jews in New York City. I don't see a lot of Muslim kids who are missing eyes or arms or legs, so their parents aren't stoning them, right? They, you have to look and see not just what is said in the text, but what the actual people who follow that text are doing. So Indonesian Muslims behave differently than Saudis. Uh, and so what I, all I'm trying to say is that we've got to recognize that there are a billion people here. They they're of different species, and they actually come in different nationalities and different um, cultures and different languages. Uh, and they're not all the same. We can do business with some of them, and there are others of them that are a grave threat to us. And both of them appeal to different phases of Muhammad. Hello, my name is Jason. 
Japanese chat at the moment. In, in countries like China, Singapore, other areas in the Middle East where authoritarianism, social structure is much more emphasized over individuality and choice. Do you believe that American principles such as democracy and other principles um, are feasible or even preferable there? And if so, what would be an American policy towards cultivating that? So the question is about is our American principles like democracy um, a product that can be planted in foreign soil that has been cultivated over many centuries uh, in very different environments. Um, this is almost like asking, uh, if you think about the early Christians when they, once they moved out of the Jewish world, think of the environments that they found themselves in. They, they, ran, they went into Iran where there were Zoroastrians uh, and then they went into the far-flung reaches of the Roman Empire where there was polytheism and paganism and then Hinduism in India. And so completely different climates, cultures, and cosmologies. And these Christians had to persuade those people to become Christian, embrace a Christian culture, and uh, change their lives. Um, and they did that. It wasn't easy. It took a long time. Um, now, with regard to America, um, even the Western principles that we have uh, have different versions to them. There are parliamentary systems in Europe. We have a presidential system, for example. Uh, democracy, I think, is, is, a, is a plant that can actually be seeded almost anywhere in the world. Why? Because democracy is nothing more than a system of counting heads. Just democracy now. I'm not talking about Remember, we have a complicated system, separation of powers, checks and balances, an independent judiciary, minority rights. That is, we have a whole thing. Democracy is simply, what do the people in this room, the people, actually think? Right? And that is simply a matter of figuring out a way to discern what people in this room act. Do we want to raise taxes? Yes or no? Take out your iPad and you can check yes or you can vote no. We can do that anywhere in the world. There's no reason that democracy, which simply means elections and counting heads, can't occur in any country. There's nothing Western about it. If you have democracy in China, you'll figure out what the Chinese people actually think. Now, the Chinese government doesn't want to figure out what the Chinese people actually think. So they're oppo they oppose democracy not because democracy is Western. They oppose democracy because they want to tell you what they think. They don't care what you think. So um, now, to me, the more important thing to export is not democracy, although democracy is good. But um, the more important things to export is um, the free market, the system of personal and religious and intellectual liberty, freedom of thought. To me, those ideas which I would associate with classical liberalism are actually more important. Uh, than democracy. Um, now, ultimately, we would like them to go hand in hand with democracy. But actually, if you look at history, liberalism and democracy, they're cousins in the West, but they are not cousins in nature. There's nothing that inherently binds them together. And what I mean by that is think about, think about a group of radical Islam. Think about, a, about Hamas. Hamas can collect its membership and put everyone to a vote. And the vote is, let's go blow up Israel. Or the vote is, let's round up all the women and put them into burqas. And everybody democratically votes for that. And they favor that. They're not forced. They voluntarily think it's a great idea. So this is democracy being deployed against liberalism. This is democracy being deployed against, let's say, giving women the choice of what to wear. The majority of the people democratically vote against it. So democracy is not a natural ally of liberalism. It just so happens that in this country we have voted democratically to have a liberal system. It wasn't necessary that we do it. We just happened to do it. So liberal democracy are two different things married together.
Hi, my name is Paul. My question with regards to um, developing a strategy and the rhetoric we use when challenging the rise of radical Islam. So here tonight, you developed and you, um, you gave an abridged version of the history of Islam. And as I understand ISIS, part of what ISIS and radical Islam does is they often victimize Muslims, as kind of as you said, as the West is suppressing us from what we were and what we could be. And we seem to be struggling to, to develop a clear strategy in challenging ISIS. And when thinking about that and when developing that strategy, how do we avoid a rhetoric as a nation and as a one-on-one -on -one that doesn't add fuel to that fire? ISIS is, recru is recruiting off of the, the idea that it's us against the West. Right. Do you understand? Yeah, of course. Okay. The question is, ISIS is recruiting by the idea it's us against them, it's us against the West. Now, very interestingly, the, the way that the radical Muslims uh, recruit successfully is not by attacking the Christian West. The radical Muslims recruit most effectively by attacking the secular West. And unfortunately, it is the secular West that is most on display in the non-Western world. In other words, I think of my mom in her living room in Bombay, Mumbai, turning on the TV. She's very unlikely to see Joel Olstein. Um, she's much more likely just to see um, some perverted Hollywood movie that's giving her the idea that in the West, freedom is the same as complete moral decadence. Remember that outside of the West, most of the cultures of the world are quite traditional. And one of the slogans of recent decades in Asia and Africa uh, has been modernization, yes, westernization, no. And the reason for that is that, that all these third world people want prosperity. They want nice homes and they want clean toilets and they want iPhones. But they don't necessarily want what they see as the uh, depraved, anti-family, um, uh, excessively materialistic, um, and um, decadent aspects of Western culture, or European as well as American. They don't want that. And the radical Muslims use that to basically say, you need to go our way because the alternative is this. It's these shameless people who don't even know what true feelings are. Um, it's these shameless people whose lives end up in complete wrecks. And so, there's got to be a better way, and Islam offers that straight path. So, ironically, the cultural left, by putting Western decadence on full global exhibit, is actually subsidizing and strengthening the recruitment strategies of radical Islam. I start by saying thank you, Dinesh, for coming here and speaking. Anyways, now, you know how Bernie Sanders is saying he wants to give us free college? Am I too far off saying this way? He's not telling us is after you graduate and get a job, you'll be paying 75 to 80% in taxes to pay for it. Would I be too far off on that? So the question is about Bernie Sanders. And um, I was just reading recently a um, story about Bernie Sanders' own life in the magazine Mother Jones, a leftist magazine. Um, and it basically said that until a few years ago when Bernie Sanders was elected to political office, the guy couldn't pay his electric bill. He would often sleep in other guys' homes. Uh, he was essentially a complete bum. Uh, and I think what he, he discovered to his great excitement uh, is that government employment uh, has an essentially enabled the guy to get essentially a self-supporting job for the first time. Look, this is actually progressivism run amok, by which I mean, you know, if you think of the, the liberal half of the country, the idea that for the president they're fielding this guy, Rip Van Winkle from the 1960s, <laughs> who just woke up from his 20-year nap. Uh, and um, I mean, this is an actually more than embarrassing. Now, I have to say that to me, the appeal of Sanders is that however whacked he is, um, he is at least an idealist, right? The alternative is Hillary Clinton, an adopted member of the Corleone family. 
So the shameless scandals and self-dealing transactions of the Clintons are making even Democrats feel dirty. And so Bernie, uh, precisely because he's so out of it, uh, appears to be in a certain way refreshingly clean uh, compared with the alternative. And I think that is the source of his appeal. To actually discuss his ideas is actually probably not a good idea. Hi there, my name's Aaron Connor, and during my stay in England for a while, I came across what is known as the Trojan Horse and how it infiltrated the education system. And now over the past, it's been a year since I've been back in the country, I've noticed some Muslims infiltrating the education system here in the United States. What is your policy or your thoughts on preventing and combating the Trojan horse from happening here in the United States? The question is about what do we do from stopping Muslim infiltration of the United States? Now, I want to distinguish between terrorism uh, that operates covertly through cells and so on. That's a national security threat. And a separate issue, which is political infiltration. Now, of political infiltration, I, I might be wrong on this, but I think that it's very difficult for Muslims to, to do that. Um, first of all, political infiltration in America and political power takes a certain kind of obvious sophistication. Right? So, for example, if, there, if you turn on the TV and you have an Israeli guy debating a Palestinian guy, and you look at the Israeli guy, you'll notice that he's a very Western looking guy, speaks beautiful English, speaks in a completely comprehensible way. Then the Muslim guy comes on, and you basically have to kind of like lock your door. In other words, if, if the Muslims were smart, they would put some guy on TV not some guy with a beard uh, who looks like he's about to bomb the station. Um, they would put some guy on TV who's a white guy and looks completely inoffensive and likable. It would make jokes and, 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 and would possibly even be gay. Um, in other words, the idea would be to completely, <laughs> to completely disarm Americans from any sense of feeling a threat about Islam. It certainly would be some guy with some sort of an accent so here's what I'm getting at. Whenever I see Islamic propaganda, it's super unsophisticated, goofy, and ridiculous. Um, politically, I think it's very difficult for it to really do much. Now, the reason it is effective, however, is not because of Islam, but because of liberalism. So the people that I'm scared of are not the Muslims on campus who say, you know, we want to celebrate Ramadan and we want the whole campus to face Mecca. I'm scared of the dean who thinks that's a good idea. That guy is a real sicko, right? That is the guy who's actually empowering radical Islam. Uh, so, so it's liberalism that is facilitating the political penetration of Islam. Again, this is a matter of being really precise as to what we want to fight. You don't need to go fight Islam right here. You need to fight liberalism right here. Uh, there's a separate national security threat, and we should, in fact, deal with that. Can I say a concluding thought? Um, just want to say very generally to you guys um, that um, if, you want to, if you want to fight effectively in America today, you've got to use your power in a, in a laser-like way. And I want to just conclude by telling you how to do that. A year ago, um, the retail giant Costco made a decision to pull all copies of my book, America, from all Costco's in the country. I don't exactly know how this happened, but it was sort of a, one of those, I look at it hypothetically as some sort of a strike by the left. Oh my God, this guy D'Souza, critic of the Obama administration, here is books in Costco, and the leadership of Costco is in the Democratic camp. And so Costco somehow decides, let's pull the book. And they do. Now, 10 years ago, nothing could be done about it. But today, 
I don't even know about it, but there's a journalist who writes for a website, WorldNet Daily, and he writes an article about it. And his readership, about a thousand people are on the website, screaming at Costco. Costco, how dare you? Costco censorship. This is a little online mob. But it's an online mob in the wrong place. Costco doesn't care. Suddenly, very interesting move in the history of social media, someone in that online mob says, why are we on the WorldNet Daily site? Let's go to the Costco site. And so the snowball begins to roll to Costco, collecting snow along the way. By the time it gets to Costco, it's 17,000 people. And these 17,000 people, if you were to go on the Costco website, on which Costco does a great deal, half of its worldwide business, and you click on jeans, barbecue grills, toilet paper, danishes, doesn't matter, wine, you would see young people, dignified ladies, CEOs in Florida, Texas, Ohio, California, cutting up their Costco card and sending pieces of it to the CEO. Now, what I'm getting at is this produces a massive panic in Costco. Why? Because no business can afford to have its own customers destroy their website through customer reviews that basically say, you suck. <laughs> so, so literally they call me in for an emergency meeting. I go up to Seattle to meet the CEO of Costco. The first words coming out of his mouth, you are destroying Costco. I'm destroying Costco. A billion dollar corporation with huge customer loyalty. By the time I re reach San Diego, Costco has decided, number one, to reverse its decision. Number two, to put all my books back. Number three, to order 25,000 new books. Number four, <laughs> when my movie comes out two weeks later, they build a special stand. <laughs> oh now, now, so, so this is in the age of social media. This is using, now 17,000 people is a lot, but you've got more at liberty. This is called using laser-like precision strikes. It's not random screaming. It's not, let's have a constitutional convention. It's not, write, a, write an email or put a blog. It is focus and, and strike. I'll have a movie coming out this summer. It's going to be quite a movie. Secret History of Hillary Clinton and the Democratic Party. Right? Um, so I'll release it probably the week of the Democratic Convention. Uh, right? Um, now. Now, here's the thing. If you go and see the movie the weekend it comes out, it is 10 times more valuable to us than if you see it any other time. Because Hollywood watches the opening week. We'll open in 2,000 theaters. If we do well, we'll be in 3,000 theaters the next week. If we do poorly, we'll be in 1,100 theaters the next week. So you can put total rocket fuel in our rocket by going opening weekend. Now look, this is not like give us 500 bucks, give us a thousand bucks. No, it's 10 bucks to see the movie. And it's going to be, if you like 2016, this is a movie of a completely different caliber. So if you, if you urge your friends to go, you have social media, go, if you go that weekend, that's a way of using your leverage, right? And then people will say to me, and this is not so much for you guys, but I'll speak to women's groups in Texas and in Florida and California, and they'll say, in California, our vote is wasted because this is a liberal state. Our vote is wasted because this is Texas. Obviously, it's going to go for the Republicans. And I say, yeah, that may be true. But, but, here you are, the Women's Republican Club of Dallas. You're a very powerful group right here in this room. Now, this election will probably be decided by two million voters in Florida and Ohio and Colorado and North Carolina and the names and addresses of those voters is known. We have it. So, again, I'm making a movie which will be out in DVD on the 1st of October. So, it is within your power, Women's Republican Club of Dallas, to buy 50,000 DVDs and put them in the hands of swing voters in Ohio the actual people who will decide the election. Here are all these ridiculous you know, political action committees spending $100 to get one vote and buying commercials galore, wasting a whole bunch of money, pouring it down the tube, but for pennies on the dollar, you can take a 90-minute movie that 
you don't even have to spend any money to make. Investors have, have, have invested in, in my company to make the movie. We're giving you the movie. And you can drop it in the hands of the people deciding the election. That is called using influence in a, in a, in a lethal way. So this is what I mean. Most people in society flail around and don't achieve anything. Their impact is almost zero. But if you are creative about it, you can, you can have impact that is five, ten, a hundred, a thousand times your number by deploying idealism, knowledge, and then effective action. Thank you. couple of announcements before you guys start heading out. I just wanted to say thank you to every student, Liberty faculty, um, and any member of the community that has attended our event tonight. We also want to um, say a huge thank you to our parent organization, Young America's Foundation, for their constant support and assistance throughout the entire process of organizing this lecture, and most importantly, for the Wendy P. Macau um, Freedom Scholarship, which enabled us to be even able to bring Mr. D'Souza to Liberty. Um, and of course, we want to thank Mr. D'Souza for just giving a stellar speech just now and for flying all the way out from California to Lynchburg, Virginia. Um, if you choose to stick around, we will be having a photo op with Mr. D'Souza. And we are blessed with having photographers with us, and so we will be taking the photos for you. And I know you're wondering, how are we going to get the photos? Well, if you like us at Liberty University, Young Americans for Freedom on Facebook, in a couple of days we'll be uploading all of the photos onto an online album. So you'll be able to not only get your photo with Dinesh D'Souza, but you'll also be able to download any of the other pictures that have been taken throughout this event. Um, so we want to open that up for you, and we'll be forming a line in front of the podium over here. Um, and then also for those of you who possibly this event has made you more interested in getting involved in the conservative movement um, and being a part of, more specifically, the Liberty University Young Americans for Freedom chapter, we do meet every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. in DeMoss in room 1106. And thank you again for everyone who attended and took time out of your evening to come to this event. And I hope you all enjoyed it and that you have safe travels. Thank you. in this corner over here, and then if you could just exit out this door over here at the end, um, which makes it really smooth and we just get everyone through. There will be no cell phones being used. They're all being taken um, by a professional photographer. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, if you guys just want to start the line right here where I'm, and go that way, and just kind of wrap around there. No issue will have a bigger impact on the future performance of our economy 
than education. See, a great university like this one is on the front lines of preparing America's young people. Now, this, this is part of free speech, is you listening. Yeah, you all over you, I can you smell you. Back. Members of the Weather Underground that bombed federal buildings, including the U.S. Capitol and the Pentagon. This is a guy who lives in my neighborhood, who's a uh, professor of English. Requiring his students to recite the new Pledge of Allegiance, calling America racist, sexist, Kathy Boudin, a far-left radical convicted of felony murder, now a professor at Columbia. Bernadine Dorn, a domestic terrorist, was at Northwestern University. It's absolutely about intolerance, uh, an act of discrimination against a worldview, which is frankly held by so many across this great country. Our classrooms are infiltrated with liberals. No one has brought another side. The left, they always claim that they are so tolerant and accepting of other views, and yet when somebody disagrees with them, they seem to attack and be intolerant. It's about our ideas and our vision. Get the training that you need to be courageous leaders. And lest we get on our high horse and think this is unique to some other place. Remember that during the Crusades and the Inquisition, people committed terrible deeds in the name of Christ. In the name of Christ. Christ. I believe in the Constitution. You'll be able to keep your health care plan, period. Nobody is listening to your telephone calls. On the advice of my counsel, I respectfully exercise my Fifth Amendment right. The fact is, phone. we had four dead Americans. What difference does it make? No issue will have a bigger impact on the future performance of our economy than education. See, a great university like this one is on the front lines of preparing America's young people. Now, this, this is part of free speech, is you listening. Yeah, all over you, I can smell you. Why are you teaching activity? What do you have to say? Members of the Weather Underground that bombed federal buildings, including the U.S. Capitol and the Pentagon. This is a guy who lives in my neighborhood who's a uh, professor of English. Requiring his students to recite the new Pledge of Allegiance, calling America racist, sexist. Kathy Boudin, a far-left radical convicted of felony murder, now a professor at Columbia. Bernadine Dorn, a domestic terrorist, was at Northwestern University. It's absolutely about intolerance, uh, an act of discrimination against a worldview, which is frankly held by so many across this great country. Our classrooms are infiltrated with liberals. No one has brought another side. The left, they always claim that they are so tolerant and accepting of other views, and yet when somebody disagrees with them, they seem to attack and be intolerant. It's about our ideas and our vision. Get the training that you need to be courageous leaders. <laughs>